Well, hi, and welcome back to my next audio podcast. I realize that my previous video on the basics of string theory um, hasn't received any hits, um, probably because of my seemingly abrupt, ambiguous link between spirituality and theoretical physics. Uh, this was intended, as I really just wanted to get your mind sinking in that direction, um, so I make the next podcast on this link a little more easy going, as it will hopefully explain this connection and uh, bring forth cues as to uh, put forth the idea that consciousness and quantum physics really do appear to operate in conjunction in at least some circumstances but uh, anyhow apologies for that uh, this podcast is much a con- is it, sorry is much a continuation of my previous podcast on string theory as it is a new topic uh, and this one focuses predominantly on the latest incarnation of string theory um, that of the most elegant length of the string so to speak uh, since the theory of strings is brought to length in the late 20th century uh, firstly though just some extras on string theory uh, due to the large number of possible topologies and energies, the theory predicts as many as 10 to the 500 universes, which is an exceptionally large number, far too big for the mind to rationalise. At least an I can't. But these 10 to the 500 universes, making up the string multiverse as it is, or at least a string theory version of the multiverse idea, uh, relate to the quantum field theory, or QFT idea, of the true and false vacuum. Uh, where the energies involved in being applied to our own situation are thought to have given rise to our universe, uh, whereupon it began in a state of false vacua and entered into the true vacua, which we see today. In other words, the Big Bang can be seen as a sort of energy transition, if you will. Uh, so this multitude of universes, known collectively as the string theory landscape or anthropic landscape, uh, since it includes all the possibilities allowed by the strings in terms of dimensions and space-time properties, as well as including or involving the probability spectrum for life-sustaining universes like ours. Uh, What's also worth mentioning as a side note is that these strings themselves are not fixed, uh, but can exist as open or closed strings, uh, whereby what happens when they interact depends a lot on how they are to begin with, as well as being quite important in how the theory relates to uh, what's seen in particle accelerators, Um, something that is relatively understandable from our macroscopic points of view, thankfully. Uh, While on the topic of the string theory multiverse, though, um, the M-theory multiverse, if you can envision the many universes predicted as slices of bread, it exists in a much larger space called the bulk, or uh, the bulk space. Um, Whatever that is exactly is another question entirely. Um, It's uh, something that I may attend to in later podcasts, though. But in the meantime, just, uh, just imagine the bulk as the entire loaf of bread, so all the all the universes in their entirety. It's, uh, anyway, um, the latest theory of strings lies in M-theory, and uh, M-theory, since its inception around 15 years ago, has uh, centred itself in the notion of brains, um, that is B-R-A-N-E-S. Now, these brains are built up from the strings as basically a higher order of them, so to speak, uh, where the strings and brains share commonalities within their respective domains, as they are really the same theory, just different sides of the coin. Uh, so this theory is much more recent than the string theory, uh, as you might have guessed, um, even though they are essentially the same, but uh, due to the inherent nature of the brains uh, within the reality of the strings, took an extra 25 years to surface through the uh, fine cosmic symphony that it is, especially since the brains are representative of the apparent fundamental reality which connects the strings, and so naturally one can expect some more digging before such a connection is made. It, uh, now, these brains come in many different forms, uh, depending on their dimensional arena. Uh, the two main types include D brains and P brains. Um, that's just a, a D and a P. Um, where, the, um, where the D brains, uh, named uh, after their discoverer, are essentially extensions of the P brains, um, where open ended strings can be attached, so to speak, and remain within our universe. I should say now that I am sorry for uh, any ambiguation and any of the explanations I give, but uh, this ideology or (laughs) really this sort of stuff in general isn't like we know of, and uh, as you know it does operate on uh, different terms which the mind has trouble rationalising, but it's essentially the nature of it. uh, So yeah, the the P in P brains indicates a P number of spatial dimensions, uh, for which just like the strings, the brain can vibrate in in different ways and move through and the number of dimensions it's associated with, uh, in terms of moving through them, bring about what are called world volumes. Um, so their volumes are, are essentially uh, what cause the world volumes. 
Uh, this is easier to understand by just envisioning three-dimensional brains or three brains, as they're called, um, for which we for which we um, we may be living in if our universe is indeed one of these brains. But uh, yeah, so uh, moving through space-time and um, this understandable movement uh, brings about the world volume. Uh, so uh, remember to envision these as three-dimensional enclosed brains, just to make it a bit easier. Uh, now these p-brains can exist as zero brains, um, where we uh, basically get back to point particles, therefore we can still essentially derive the entire standard model. Uh, just remember, however, that although this is true, um, the whole hypothesis of this idea is that the concept of point particles is merely the objective manifestation of these brains at various energy levels. Uh, where the revolution begins in 11 dimensions and uh, makes its way into our day-to-day -day interactions. Uh, however, what's called duality forms uh, very intriguing and important bridges between the string and brain domains. Uh, this duality works off the relationships among the different string models, uh, five if you remember, and uh, ties them into a neat framework uh, where it makes clear the hidden but nevertheless more fundamental level of the brains. Uh, especially in the way certain features of the topologies in string theory uh, relate to topologies in M-theory, as well as to themselves and each other, I might add, um, being in the nature of what I said before. Uh, just in that they share common qualities and quantities associated with their <laughs> need for each other, to put it lightly. But, uh, the D-brains, in particular, arise from the symmetries involved with charge and so forth in uh, relation to how the strings behave in space-time. In other words, the brains themselves can uh, the brains themselves sorry seem to arise um, out of the requirements of the mathematics involved with the conditions these strings must obey in space-time when it comes to the standard concepts associated with fields, um, specifically electromagnetism or EM. It seems, but uh, I guess it gives us a perspective at just how many weird and wacky alien objects are simply hiding in plain sight among the equations we use every day that we simply haven't detected yet, uh, mostly because we haven't yet um, the mathematical techniques to do so. so. Now um, one of the biggest ideas to ever come out of the brain world or brain cosmology uh, since its inception is that of colliding universes or more specifically the epicritic universe idea, uh, notably developed by a Pennsylvanian theoretical physicist uh, Bert Overett, uh, where it goes that since these brains can exist, they're naturally being multi-dimensional objects uh, they could collide with one another um, while floating around, um, if you will, in whatever, it, um, whatever the arena is in which they exist. And uh, when this random but eventual collision occurs out of the countless universes that are said to exist, then it's calculated that since these brains are oscillating on their surface, the energy and kinetics which would be resultant from the interaction of these oscillating surfaces uh, could translate into what we know of um, today as the galaxies and so forth. Uh, so with this in mind, and in fact thinking of the brains in terms of rippling sheets rather, then it's conceivable to understand how two brain worlds uh, could come together and quite easily create something as inconceivable as what we call the singularity. Um, that is that infinitesimally small volume uh, supposedly containing our entire universe at the beginning, or at least the observable universe. It's, uh, which seemingly too incredible to grasp. Um, when you really think about it, isn't so much so, because according to quantum theory, the universe is mostly empty anyway. And the so-called singularity, according to brain cosmology, although still a point of infinite density, is something of possibly regular occurrence, um, as it seems to be reached as any two brains get within a certain proximity of intersection. Um, and hence this gives significant credence to the ideology of the singularity and how everything could come from nothing, so to speak. Uh, by means of such tremendous energies from between two interacting brains. Um, but it even gives insight into dark energy um, via uh, understanding of what's going on with the brains in association with the sandwich concentration of energy and, and uh, in how these brains can keep coming back for more um, via a continued state of collisions uh, due to the all mysterious force of gravity dragging them back and creating a scenario where we may be in for yet another apocalyptic event from the same brains um, involved in our universe's existence and uh, this may be our ultimate fate, uh, it seems, or at least the universe's. But uh, all in all, um, these membranes, apart from providing massive insight into these matters, um, gives, as a consequence of what I've just mentioned, an answer to the most pressing issue of all time, um, 
that is uh, what existed before the beginning. Uh, although by this I don't necessarily mean anything to do with God, etc., uh, since science would rather stay objective, um, but at least a scientifically based idea, uh, despite the abstract qualities and quantities. Uh, since it points to a space of the sorts where these brains are moving around and uh, every now and then coming together and giving rise, just like a spark of beauty, I should say, to our worlds of intelligence, including ours, of course. As Professor Hawking would so ele elegantly put it, uh, it's not necessary for God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going, since, of course, in my own words, uh, these brain worlds are doing the work for him. But, um, now, uh, since the next podcast or so will be focused on consciousness, um, while we're on this, um, it's easy to understand how all of this could be summed up as, if not the work of the divine, something beyond the rationalism of science. I mean, uh, even though a form or level of science seems to be going on with membranes and strings playing out acts of marble on a stage seemingly set to accord beautifully um, with what appears to be a symphony of uh, harmonic hyperspace, uh, one must consider that although there is no doubt that it's possible for the existence of an orchestra, uh, we must ultimately realise that even if there were some ultimate orchestra plucking away notes to create something in which existence can occupy a landscape fit for everything that can exist uh, within its medium of, medium of masquerade, um, the very notion that there must be an orchestra um, comes from us to begin with, um, or more precisely within us. Um, thus, although there can't really be anything to discard the possibility of something existing, um, which has no merit for its existence in the first place, uh, given that we do inevitably feel attracted to a higher sense of reality, uh, whatever that may be, uh, due to the desire or need to fill in the gap, so to speak, for what we don't understand. Now, uh, given this reasoning, isn't it a rather familiar exercise to think along the lines of consciousness, or at least to some extent mind, uh, when considering the grand scope of the grand unified field? Um, since we essentially know a, a, about as much of mind as we do matter, shouldn't it stand to reason that given the substance of mind, which is essentially more akin to the quantum, um, that that of the unified field in the quantum realm, um, which appears to stand as the basis for matter, uh, where these very things are uh, acting out as the plain display of um, information, that they are somehow at some level akin to each other, or out in the limb, even to the point of being manifested forms of the same thing, um, whatever it is. Uh, now, as much as this may sound, um, as much as this may seem like a, uh, or sound I should say, even by, uh, like a leap of faith, isn't it we as conscious beings who put the entire scope of the cosmos within the realm of mind to begin with, as it's us who are experiencing it first hand, um, as the anthropic principle goes, uh, not that I'm running along the lines of this theology, but, um, are we not at least um, part of that unification, um, part of that original setting? And so it's at this point that we must uh, look at ourselves and uh, just think for a moment that if we are ultimately reducible to the very stuff that makes up the unified field, can we not be manifestations or expressions of that field? Since one may say that this is simply bold speculation, um, which I believe it's, uh, is most probably the reason for such low number of viewers from my previous podcast, not only are we in this universe, but we are ultimately part of it as I've mentioned, uh, even to the point of the theory of quantum consciousness, which I will uh, talk about. Um, if, it is, uh, if it has anything to do with it, um, I do, and not to mention the work of theoretical physicist uh, Dr. John Hagelin, uh, who proposes that the unified field actually works its way up through to our experience of it, and this uh, can then explain such miraculous feats of mind, um, such as uh, psi or psychic phenomena and so forth. So in all of this, not only could meditation actually be direct experience of this unity of consciousness, if you will, um, but it would perhaps give a reasonable, even scientific avenue of inquiry, um, or even an explanation for the so far elusive origins, uh, elements of consciousness, um, putting it at the heart of the universe, so to speak, you know, as it goes. And um, indeed, this goes back to uh, my last podcast, where I mentioned that science tends to uh, lose track of quality, unfortunately, um, especially quality of experience, while it puts everything under the microscope. And uh, Now, while this seems as much a broad attack on science as it does an unnecessary scrutiny 
on the scientific mainstream, as one might say, um, since we could say that science does bring a quality of experience with it, as the more it uncovers about stuff, um, the more incredible it gets and the more special it all becomes in our eyes, as we project this knowledge into our imagination of it, um, or into our imagination of what could be, and uh, which becomes our experience of the universe. Um, in a sense, this is true. However, as much as we may marvel at the brilliance of it all, uh, for which has been unveiled, science is restricted by its own code of conduct, and so it's ultimately up to us to realise what science can't by itself. And that is um, the incomprehensible mysteriousness of the universe in the, in the legacy of Einstein, um, for which experience alone seems only able to fathom. So uh, I hope to have you a listener in the next podcast. Thanks.